Ellen White arrived in Australia in December of 1891. While on the voyage from the United States, and again on her arrival, she received a number of visions. Some of these related to the workers in the Australian publishing house. In a manuscript, she wrote out what she had been shown. Much of this instruction was written for the publishing house treasurer, Nathaniel Falkhead. Falkhead was a tall and energetic businessman with a generous disposition. But at the time of his becoming a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, he was also a prominent leader of a number of secret societies. And as time passed, he became more and more engrossed in his lodge activities and less involved in his work for the church. Some of his associates grew concerned about his waning spirituality and urged him to consider the direction of his life. But Forkhead firmly rejected any such promptings. It was about this time that Ellen White wrote down what had been revealed to her. But when she thought to mail it to Falkhead, it seemed that a voice spoke to her and restrained her, for the employees in the publishing house were not yet ready to receive such a message. Some 12 months later, the very first term of the first Seventh-day Adventist school in Australia had just ended. In attendance at the closing exercises in Melbourne was Ellen White. Afterwards, she invited Nathaniel Falkhead to visit her. On his arrival, she began to read to him from the manuscript. As she described some of the meetings of the secret order, she reminded him about his habit of dropping small coins into the church offering plate and large coins into the lodge funds. She also told of how she heard him addressed as worshipful master and warned him that no man should be addressed in this way. Although she did not attack the Masonic lodge system itself, she pointed out how difficult it is for the Christian to serve two masters. As she spoke, she made a movement with her hand, which startled Falkhead. Do you know what you have done? You have just made the secret sign of the Masons, the sign of the Knights Templar. As they continued talking, again she made a movement with her hand. Suddenly Falkhead turned deathly pale. The sign she had made was known only to the highest order of Masons, a sign no woman could know. For the next two hours, Falkhead struggled with his conscience. Eventually he resolved to sever his connections with the lodges and finally did so, but not without a conflict. The Lord has honoured me greatly in speaking to me through Mrs White. He has presented my case to her and called me by name. So I will heed the instruction from the Lord. Ellen White's experience with Nathaniel Forkhead illustrates some important aspects of how the prophetic gift operated in Bible times and how it continues to operate today. First, Prophets are often given information through the supernatural means of visions or prophetic dreams, which enable them to see people and experience events outside of their range of knowledge. Second, they are then directed to communicate the Lord's message to the people concerned. He or she for women were also called to be prophets, then delivers the message in oral, written, or enacted form. Essentially, a prophet is the mouthpiece of God. That is why the prophetic gift is called the testimony of Jesus. This does not mean that God dictates the message to the prophet. Rather, the Spirit of Christ imbues the prophet's mind with thoughts. The prophet then selects the words to express those thoughts received through vision or dream. It also means that the writer's own culture, educational level and home background 
play important roles in the way these messages are then delivered. To express their thoughts, some Bible writers borrowed from the words written by other Bible writers. Some, like Luke, selected passages from non-inspired historical sources. Paul used the words of secular poets, and both Jude and John quoted from the non-biblical Jewish book of Enoch. Yet under the direction of God's Spirit, the prophet is inspired, and the message becomes the word of God. It is also obvious that there were some prophets whose testimonies were not included in the books of the Bible. The messages of Nathan, Gad, Azariah, Deborah, Miriam, Agabus, Silas and Philip's four daughters, for example. But this does not make their messages unimportant or even less inspired. It simply means that they were of local and relatively temporary value. Prophets also played a prominent part in the New Testament church. According to the book of Acts, they initiated the church missionary outreach, selected personnel, and directed where they should be sent. In 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says that the prophetic gift strengthens the church and brings it encouragement and consolation. Paul also writes in Ephesians 4 that prophets are one of the main agencies Christ has placed in the church to bring about unity. Their counsels, therefore, help protect the church from false doctrines. According to Acts 15, prophets reaffirmed the believers in the true teaching of the church during times of religious controversy. But above all else, Paul teaches that the prophet's prime purpose is to lead men and women to Christ and establish them in a relationship with him. To help accomplish this goal, Jesus predicted through the New Testament prophets that such activity would continue in the church. The testimony of Jesus was not to cease with the book of Revelation. In fact, the books of Joel and Revelation indicate that the gift of prophecy will especially assist the church toward the end of time. It is logical to expect that this latter-day manifestation of the testimony of Jesus will fulfill the same role and functions as did the prophets in biblical times. God will again reveal his purposes through the medium of visions and dreams. He will also inspire the messenger so that the message itself will guide, rebuke, and challenge the church. The question that must be addressed, of course, is how did Ellen White exercise this prophetic gift in her ministry to the Seventh-day Adventist Church? In 1860, she wrote that when the Lord gave her a vision, she was taken into the presence of Jesus and was unconscious of her surroundings. Like the prophet Ezekiel, her attention, when in vision, was often directed to scenes taking place on earth, though she could see no farther than the angel directed her. Sometimes she was shown future events. On other occasions, events of the past were revealed. Often she could not remember what she had been shown until she commenced writing. At other times, she could not recall anything until she came in contact with the people to whom the vision applied. She then remembered clearly and forcibly the instruction given though it may have been shown to her years before. I am just as dependent upon the Spirit of the Lord in relating or writing a vision as in having the vision. I have been shown faces that I had never seen, and years afterward, I knew them when I saw them. I have written at midnight letters that have gone across the continent and arriving at a crisis have saved great disaster to the cause of God. There was perhaps no greater crisis in the Seventh-day Adventist Church during the first 60 years of its history than the threat of pantheism. Pantheists believe that God is not a great personal being, but a mysterious essence, an impersonal influence pervading all nature. Though he exists in all things, in trees, flowers, air and animals, he is as impersonal as gravitation or the rays of the sun.
This teaching had been adopted and taught as new advanced truth by some of the church leaders in Battle Creek. In reality, it threatened the very foundations of the biblical view of God. Dr. John Harvey Kellogg, the brilliant doctor and superintendent of the church's medical institution in Battle Creek, was one of a number of church leaders who were attracted to this philosophy as early as the 1880s. But it was not until 1897 that he first introduced the teaching in a public way. At the 1899 General Conference meetings, held here in the South Lancaster Church in Massachusetts, pantheistic ideas were again promoted by several of the church's leaders. Ellen White was in Australia at the time, but she was impressed to post to the conference a number of testimonies. One carried the title, The True Relation of God and Nature. Nature is not God and never was God. The voice of nature testifies of God, declaring his glory. But nature itself is not God. As God's created work, it but bears a testimony of his power. Well, brethren, what do you think? The timing of these communications was significant. They had been written here in Australia nearly four weeks before the conference began but they arrived just when they were needed. However, that was not the end of the matter. Pantheistic teaching soon became rampant at Battle Creek College and in the sanitarium, which was under Dr. Kellogg's control. In February 1902, the huge Battle Creek sanitarium was burnt to the ground. A new building was needed, and to help defray the costs, it was suggested that Dr. Kellogg write a book on health care. All income from its sale would be used to help rebuild the sanitarium. Kellogg was warned, however, against including any pantheistic ideas in it. But when this book, The Living Temple, finally came from the press, it was clear to some at least that he had not taken any notice of the direction. In 1903, church leaders planned that the annual council should meet in Washington, D.C. Church president, Arthur Daniels, hoped that no reference would be made to the living temple or to Kellogg's pantheistic ideas. However, when Kellogg and his supporters from Battle Creek arrived, it was evident that a confrontation was unavoidable. Gentlemen, what we need is a new understanding of God. Pantheism will give that to us. It'll give us no, a religious experience. I don't experience. agree with you, brother. I don't agree with you one bit. I think pantheism is going to undermine faith. Amen. And Amen. And if you were thinking to a loss of confidence, you would have to church to a loss of confidence in God. We need to hold on to our traditions. We need to no. We've been holding on to those too long. We need what you want to do is lead us somewhere where we end up with a God who doesn't care about us whatsoever. That's not what we're talking what about here, here, brethren. Please, I think we need to adjourn this meeting. Okay. Well, I don't know why we need to adjourn a meeting when we haven't even got to this. Elder Daniels dared not call for a vote because of the tension. The church was facing a crisis. But what to do? I have some things to say in reference to the new book, The Living Temple. Be careful how you sustain the sentiments of this book regarding the personality of God. As the Lord presents matters to me, these sentiments do not bear his endorsement. It is represented to me that the writer of this book is on a false track. He has lost sight of the distinguishing truths for this time. Ellen White had written the letters from her Elmshaven home in California and had mailed them about a week before. 
Was it just coincidence that the letters came from thousands of miles away at the very moment they were needed? Daniels and many others certainly did not believe that. Never were messages from God more needed than at this very time, and never were messages sent from him to his people more to the point than those you have sent us. You can never know what a great blessing your communication regarding the living temple has been to us. It came at just the right time, exactly. The conflict was severe, but your message came and settled the controversy. The Washington Council was not just a threat to organization or leadership. It involved much more, for the very understanding of the character and personality of God was under threat. That is why Ellen White decided to include in two of her books, then in preparation, some material on the issues at stake. The eighth volume of Testimonies for the Church contains over 80 pages on God and nature and the relationship between them. In the Ministry of Healing, she wrote a section entitled The Essential Knowledge that stresses the importance of knowing about the kind of God who is running the universe. This was always of supreme importance to Ellen White. Her constant aim, both in her sermons and writings, was to uplift Jesus and his love before the world. Unfortunately, this was not always foremost in the thinking of the church. Take the church here in Battle Creek. To no church of her time did she communicate more than to this church. Seventh-day Adventists had begun their work in this Michigan city in 1852, when the retired sea captain, Joseph Bates, visited the city looking for the most honest man in town. Directed by the postmaster Leonard Stewart to David Hewitt, a Presbyterian peddler, Bates convinced him of the importance of keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath and Hewitt became the first Sabbath-keeping Adventist in Battle Creek. In 1855, the publishing work of the church moved from Rochester, New York, to Battle Creek, and soon this small, two-storied wooden structure was erected to house the press. During the decades that followed, steam-powered equipment replaced the little hand press, and the publishing work mushroomed. A succession of small wooden churches were built in Battle Creek, each one larger than its predecessor to cater for the growing membership. In this second building, the young church decided on its name, Seventh-day Adventist, in 1860, and on its method of organization in 1863. In 1866, in response to a vision given to Ellen White, the church opened its first health institution. The Western Health Reform Institute, as it was called, was founded in a remodeled old house in Battle Creek. Its aim was not only to treat people with sensible remedies, but also to teach people how to take care of themselves and thus prevent sickness. Little did its founders dream that within a few decades, it would gain world recognition under its dynamic head physician, Dr. John Kellogg. In 1872, the first Seventh-day Adventist school was opened in the city. It began in the little two-storied building that had first housed the publishing work. Seven years later, the famous Dime Tabernacle, the fourth Adventist church building in the city, was dedicated. An imposing brick structure, it could seat 3,200 people and provided an ideal location for general conference meetings. In less than 30 years, Battle Creek had become a mecca for church members because the church provided education, work and health care opportunities not to be found anywhere else. But Ellen White recognised the danger signals of such intense centralisation. Amazingly, during the decades that followed, her warnings went largely unheeded. By the late 1890s, the Review and Herald publishing house was the largest in all of Michigan. 
Up on the hill, the sanitarium, now world famous, had a staff numbering nearly a thousand. More than two thousand church members and visitors crowded into the dime tabernacle each Sabbath. But all the way from Australia, where Ellen White was living during the 1890s, she urged that no more plans for expansion be made. She saw the need to build smaller institutions in diverse areas. She also knew from the visions given her that great changes were soon to sweep over the world. In 1890, she had written of coming troubles on all sides, with the sinking of thousands of ships and the destruction of navies. Human lives would be sacrificed by millions, she said. Confusion, collision and death would unexpectedly occur on the great lines of travel. Remember that in 1890, a world war was unthinkable and planes and gasoline-powered cars had not even been invented. But her words were found to be all too true. 24 years later, in World War I, 10 million people died and another 40 million in World War II. And there have been vast losses of life on the great lines of travel ever since. At the General Conference in Battle Creek in 1901, some steps were taken to decentralize the church organization. However, Ellen White's warnings about the increasing commercialization and unfair wages in the publishing house fell largely on deaf ears. But in November 1901, a startling message was delivered to the members of the publishing house board. She reminded them that God had established the publishing house to publish his truth. But this goal had been forgotten in the seeking after commercial profit. Then came the warning. I have been almost afraid to open the review, fearing to see that God has cleansed the publishing house by fire. Unless there is a reformation, calamity will overtake the publishing house and the world will know the reason. It soon did. On the night of December 30, 1902, the main building of the publishing house was reduced to ashes. This was some 10 months after the church's famous Battle Creek Sanitarium had also been destroyed by fire. When news of the fire reached Ellen White in California, she wrote to the leaders in Battle Creek, expressing her deep sorrow at the great loss the church had sustained. I am not surprised by this sad news, for in the visions of the night, I have seen an angel standing with a sword as a fire stretched over Battle Creek. Once in the daytime, while my pen was in my hand, I lost consciousness and it seemed as if this sword of flame were turning first in one direction and then in another. Disaster seemed to follow disaster because God was dishonored by the devising of men to exalt and glorify themselves. In the months that followed, the church had occasion to think seriously about the disastrous fires and their cause. The publishing leaders quickly took action to never again publish commercial work and decisions were made to move the headquarters of the church away from Battle Creek to Washington, D.C. In Bible times, the prophet, as God's mouthpiece, often spoke plain and pointed messages of warning to God's people and called them to repentance. Such messages were never popular, for they often cut across selfishness pride and love of power. In Revelation 3, Jesus wrote to one of his churches, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He is still the same today.
Through his modern messenger, Ellen White, God also gave warnings and appeals to repentance, not only to church leaders, but also to individuals. Stephen Smith and his family accepted the Adventist message in 1850 and worshipped with the Sabbath keepers here in Washington, New Hampshire. However, not long after, Smith was influenced by some so-called new light and began to preach his ideas. He became bitter and critical of the church's leadership, especially that of James and Ellen White. Late in 1851, Smith's name was reluctantly withdrawn from church fellowship because of his discordant views and bitterness. Over the next 30 years, he joined one offshoot group after another. And though warnings concerning the unbiblical teachings of these groups were issued, he felt no need of the counsel given. But God still loved Stephen Smith, and in a vision revealed his life and future to Ellen White. In the late 1850s, she wrote out what had been shown her and closed with an appeal for him to return to God. When Smith received the letter, he became angry and declared that he wanted no testimony from Ellen White. He locked it away and forgot about it. In the meantime, Smith went on his critical way a friend said he had the meanest and most withering tongue of any man he knew. And in this way he spent what should have been the best years of his life. Then in 1884, he happened to pick up a copy of the church's paper, the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. His eye caught upon an article by Ellen White. On reading it, he was impressed with its truth. As the weeks went by, he continued to read the review and his family and friends noticed a gradual change in his bitter and harsh attitudes toward the church and its leaders. A year later, Eugene Farnsworth was invited back to speak here in his home church. His old acquaintance, Stephen Smith, now 78 years of age, resolved to attend the meeting on the Sabbath morning when Farnsworth preached from this desk on the rise of the Adventist movement in Bible prophecy. Farnsworth's positive and confident words deeply affected Smith. During the following week, Smith remembered the letter he had received from Ellen White all those years ago. On retrieving it, he read about what his life would be if he continued to follow the course he had embarked on. However, what had been a prediction when it was written was now history his story, a record of how he had lived his life, for he had not changed his ways. On the following Sabbath, Smith returned to the Washington church. Farnsworth, who as yet knew nothing of this experience, had prepared a sermon on the gift of prophecy in the Adventist church. This letter was written by Eugene Farnsworth to Ellen White on July the 15th, 1885, a short time after he had preached his sermon in the Washington church. It tells how after the sermon, Smith had stood up and related to the congregation the story of the testimony he had received more than 25 years before and how he had not read it until the previous Thursday. Its truth had convicted him. Farnsworth records Smith's words on this occasion in this way. If I had heeded the testimony God sent to me, it would have changed the whole course of my life, and I should have been a very different man. Any man that is honest must say that the testimonies lead a man toward God and the Bible always. Strong words from one of her harshest former critics. 
In view of their obvious impact on individuals and on the church at large over the years, many have asked how Ellen White's inspired writings relate to the Bible in today's world. Because they are more recent, do they supersede the scriptures? Are they in some way an addition to them? Perhaps Ellen White herself deserves the last word on the matter. If you had made God's word your study, you would not have needed these. It is because you have neglected to acquaint yourselves with God's inspired book that he has sought to reach you by simple, direct testimonies. They are not to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the heart the truths of inspiration already received. Because little heed is given to the Bible, the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light.